All right, so those are the relatively simple violations of Mendel's principle. Now we're going to look at ones that are a little bit more complicated, and that has to do, for example, with million hair color. Here's an example. You've got a mouse here. This one right in the middle is black, and that one is what we call melanistic because it puts in an enormous amount of melanin, which is a really dark pigment, in its fur, into its eyes, into its retina, and so forth, and so it has this nice black uh, sort of coat. This individual here is all white. You notice the eye is sort of pink. Everything else is pink, and that's because this individual doesn't make any melanin at all. It's what we call an, uh, a mouse that is albino. And then you got this mouse here, which is brown. And this is an agouti mouse. That's the name of it because it isn't just brown. It's that the hair is both black and kind of yellow, and they're they're banded, and that's what gives it this really interesting grizzled color. All right. So if you look at this, you could think, well, maybe this could be a fairly straightforward, uh, easy thing to figure out. You could take, for example, black fur and made it with an albino individual to make this brown individual, in which case then we'd be looking at something like incomplete dominance or maybe even codominance because you got both black and yellow sort of being expressed. But it turns out that if you do the matings for that, that's not what you get. You get something that completely disagrees with that, completely con contradicts it. Here's an example. In one study that was performed uh, uh, and has been performed over and over again, two Gaudi mouse mice were bred together, and the offspring that they got were approximately nine sixteenths Gaudi, three sixteenths black, and four sixteenths albino. So that completely blows away the idea that this would be incomplete dominance, because if it was incomplete dominance, then you'd be expecting one quarter of black half a Gaudi and one quarter albino, and that is not what they got at all. So that completely contradicts the idea that this would be something simple like that. Now it turns out that the coat color determinants in these mice are very similar to the, to the hair color determinants in, uh, in humans. So I want to ask you this. Let's go back to this. This is something you see often in textbooks. You see that black hair is dominant to blonde. Okay, and so I'm going to demonstrate that that is absolutely false. And we know it's false because we know the genetics of this. We know the genetics reasonably well. And the genetics for the mice are a little bit different than humans, but it's very, very similar. There are at least five different genes, five different genes that contribute to uh, hair color. It isn't that the genes contribute equally or a certain amount into the depth or the darkness of the hair color. They all contribute things differently in different ways. The five different genes have these names. I'm not making these names up. These are what they're called, A, B, C, D, and S. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to, in this experiment, we're going to set it up so that there is a genetic background which is the same in all these animals except for the A gene and the C gene. Okay, so in this study, for example, they set it up so that everything was homozygous for all the, uh, the genes except for A and C. And they were studying specifically, when they first did the experiment, they didn't realize quite all these details. But they were studying really only these two genes and the interaction between these two genes. Okay, so that genetic background that I state right here, that's what I mean. All the other three of those genes are, are homozygous. They're not going to vary, but these other two will. Now, the A gene determines whether or not the hair gets these yellow bands to make a gouty, for example. Okay, so if you look at if you pluck a, a, a hair out of this individual, you'll see that it has these yellow bands in it. That is what makes the gouty, and that's determined by the A gene. Now, in this case, the yellow banding is dominant. Okay, so making the gouty or brown fur is dominant to black. Right, so that completely contradicts those textbooks or those. Uh, uh, Situate those, those types of resources that you find on the internet that says that black hair is dominant to blonde. It's not. It's recessive, in this case, to a Gaudi. All right, so the C gene is different. The C gene determines whether or not the animal actually makes melanin at all. Okay, so individuals who are little c, little c are recessive albino. They can't make melanin at all. If they have at least one C, then they can make this uh, melanin pigment, pigment and whether or not they're black or gouty is determined then by this A gene. Okay, so if we look then back at this data set, notice we're getting ratios of something out of 16. What does that tell us? Well, again, it makes sense. 
we are seeing two di different genes at play. Remember before, when we saw two genes in Mendel's experiment, we got Punnett squares that were 4 by 4, which were 16 cells. Same sort of thing here. In this case, then, the two Agouti mice were heterozygous for both the A and the C gene. So since they're big A, little a, that means that they're Agouti. As long as they make melanin, they're big C, therefore they make melanin, so that, that's what makes them Agouti. Okay, let, so what kind of gametes can this individual make? Well, we're going to follow the same rule that we, saw, that we saw before. This part is Mendelian. Two alleles are going to be given to the offspring, one for each trait, one A and one C. So again, what kind of combinations can we make? Well, we can make a big A, big C, big A, little C, little A, little C, big C, big C, uh, sorry, uh, little A, little C. So those are the four possible gametes that can be made. If this is the female, those are the four possible eggs. Now, the male has exactly the same genotype, so he makes sperm the exact same way, with the exact same uh, 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 genotypes. And remember, meiosis is what's producing these gametes. Okay, so each box here, like we saw before, represents a sperm cell fertilizing an egg cell. For example, this one would make a big A, little a, big C, little c to make an agouti, but this one makes little a, little a, big C, big C. Since they're big C, big C, they make melanin, and it's little a, little a, black is recessive, so this individual is black. But look at these four individuals. These four individuals are all little c, little c. So it doesn't matter what the A gene is doing, no matter what, it can't make melanin. So in this case, A, big A, is neither dominant nor recessive, and little a is neither dominant nor recessive, because they can't even work. They don't even actually interact, they can't do their, do their, their job. So all four of these have little c, little c, therefore all four of those are albino. And you can see if you count these up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 are going to be a Gaudi, 3 black, 4 albino, which is precisely what we saw in the original data set. Okay, so this is a violation of Mendel's principles, not because of dominance or two particles per trait or one particle from each parent. That all fits. The difference here is that these traits are not independent. They interact with each other. So that principle of independent assortment fails for these two genes. That is true also for the other genes that make up your hair color. So hair color is much more complicated than just simple dominance or recessiveness. In this case, this type of interaction is what we call epistasis. Epistasis simply means the action of one gene depends on the state of another gene. In this case, the C gene determines whether or not the A gene can act. If the C gene is uh, such that it produces melanin, then the A gene has an effect. But if the C gene is such that it doesn't produce melanin, then the A gene is irrelevant. And that's the concept of epistasis. Now for the final example of a violation of Mendel's principle. And I want to point something out. We're starting to see the various ways in which Mendel's principles are violated. But these are all very simple violations. There are some that are much, much more complicated. So we're just really, as always in this class, scratching the surface of what's going on. Now, this set of examples is based on this fruit fly called Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, creatures in biology because much of what we know about genetics comes from studying these flies. Believe it or not, we learned a ton about human genetics by studying insects. So, there's a trait, and this is not the only trait that's involved in this uh, species, but there's a trait that we're going to look at, which is body color. Most of the flies that you find in the wild, in fact, all the flies you find in the wild are gray. They have a gray body. So we call them the wild type. But in the laboratory, we've been culturing these organisms for years and years and years, decades. And it has popped up a couple of times, this mutant. And that mutant makes the body black. We call that ebony. So the black body, the ebony body, is something that, again, we don't see in nature. It's only a mutation that we've noticed in the laboratory. And so, therefore, we call it the mutant form, whereas the gray body is called the wild form or the wild type form. Now, there's also another trait that we want to look at, and that is the length of the wings. Again, if you are out in nature and you find these fruit flies flying around in nature, which you can uh, see all the time, they're quite common, they have long wings that allows them to fly. And so again, that makes them the wild type. So the wild type in this case have gray body and long wings. But again, in our laboratory populations, we found some that have a mutation where the wings are all shriveled up, which is called vestigial, and they're non-functional. 
they can flap all they want, but the animal can't fly with them. And it's another reason why you don't see them in the wild. They can't really survive in the wild that way. So we have a wild type body color, which is gray. We have wild type wing, which is long. We have the mutant body color, which is black. And we have the mutant wing, which is vestigial. Okay, now, body color we now know is determined by a gene that we call B. And the wild type is dominant to ebony. Okay, so individuals who are big B, big B are wild type gray. Individuals big B, little b, the heterozygote, are also wild type gray because it's dominant and little b, little b is ebony. Now there's another gene that determines wing length and that gene is called VG. Now there's two letters here, don't get confused by that, just think of it as a V. And we can talk about a big VG or a little VG. But the VG gene determines the length of the wing and long wings are dominant to vestigial. Okay, so that means this. The wild type length wings can either be big VG, big VG, or big VG, little VG. And these individuals who are vestigial have to be little, little. Okay, so what would be the phenotypes of individuals who are big B, little B, big V, little V, and little B, little B, little V, little V? Okay, well, let's look at the Bs first. This individual is big B, little B. That determines the body color. Wild type is dominant to ebony, so this individual would be gray. And... Big V, little v, the long wings are dominant, therefore this individual would be the wild type. It would have the gray body and the long wings. This individual, little b, little b, well again, that's the recessive one, so it's going to be ebony, but it's also going to have vestigial wings. Okay, now, what would you expect under Mendelian prediction if you have a ratio, uh, the, the cross between big B, little b, big V, little v, and big B, b, little b, little b, little v, little v? What would you expect to see from that? Okay, work that out. I want you to work that through before we continue on with the next little segment here. So that experiment that I just asked you to predict the outcome of was performed by this gentleman here, Thomas Hunt Morgan. And he did exactly that cross, big B, little b, big V, little v, cross, little b, little b, little v, little v. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to determine whether or not the Mendelian hypothesis is correct based on these data. Actually, we're going to ask not that question, but do the data support, contradict, or say nothing about the Mendelian hypothesis? Now remember what the Mendelian hypothesis is. In Mendel's case, the seven traits that he looked at were always independent of each other. So here's the question. Is body color independent of wing length? Do they segregate on different chromosomes like we saw with seed shape and seed color in Mendel's experiment? Okay, well, what was your prediction? What would you predict in that situation? If you work that through, then what you're going to predict is equal numbers of each possible combination. Because we've seen this before. This is a test cross, isn't it? Here we have a heterozygote crossed with a recessive individual. So we did that before. You're going to get exactly equal numbers. One quarter are going to be one phenotype, the other phenotype, the other phenotype, all equal. What phenotypes are you going to get? Well, you could get wild long. So in other words, you get gray body with long wings, or you can get ebony body with long wings, or you can get gray body with vestigial wings, or ebony body with vestigial wings. Those are the four possibilities. So here's what we're predicting. We are predicting equal numbers of each of those possible combinations. Okay? What did Hunt Morgan actually see? Well, he actually saw this. 965 were gray long. 185 were ebony long. 206 were gray vestigial and 944 were ebony vestigial. Okay, just look at those data and tell me. Do these results support, contradict, or say nothing about the hypothesis? Isn't hard to see. This is exactly not equal numbers of each. There's a lot more of these two, the wild type and the mutant type, than there are of the other two combinations. So this is indicating to us that this is not Mendelian. This is not following the Mendel pattern where the traits are independent. So how can traits not be, depend, not be independent of each other? Well, the reason they were independent in Mendel's case was that all the genes were on different chromosomes. In this case, what Hunt Morgan showed is that these genes are on the same chromosome. So they actually won't segregate independently because they're connected, physically connected together. Here's a representation of it graphically. Now, the black vestigial individual can only give little b and little v it's diploid, so it has homologous chromosomes, both carrying little b and little v. 
So whatever gametes it makes, it can only make little b, little v chromosomes. That's all it has. But notice the, the genes are on the same chromosome. Okay, now, this individual here, if you look here, the big B is on one of these chromosomes with the big V. And the little b is on the homologous chromosome with the little v. So that means this, when this creature goes through meiosis, this chromosome is going to go this way and form its own gamete, and this chromosome is going to go this way and form its own gamete, and what you're going to get is this. You're going to get big B, big V from the blue, and little b, little v from the red. So that means this. We're going to expect from that alone that this will always get fertilized by these two sperm, which means you're always going to get black vestigial, because little b, little b gives you black, and little vg, little vg gives you vestigial, or you're going to get big B, little b, which gives you the, the gray body, and big V, little v, which gives you the long wings. Okay? Okay, that's kind of what he saw. So here's the wild wild, and here's the ebony vestigial, the mutants. There, the vast majority of them came out that way. But some of them were this. Some of them were combinations of the two. So what does that tell us? That tells us somehow these chromosomes are mixing. And these types of experiments are what led to the discovery of crossing over, which we studied in the mitosis lab. In crossing over, what happens is the chromosomes will cross literally and form a chiasma or chiasmata between the two genes, in which case then the ends of the chromosomes break or the pieces of the chromosomes break and switch. So it's possible then that this could have happened that the B, the big B on the blue chromosome could have ended up being attached to the little v during crossing over because this part of the chromosome breaks off and ends up on the blue. But if that happens, then this part of the chromosome on the blue ends up on the red. And so the little b will be segregating with the big V. Okay, so that can happen. But notice it doesn't happen anywhere near as often as this where it's, they stay together. So this is telling us that these types of phenotypes, the gray vestigial and the black uh, uh, long-winged, were recombinant because recombination, crossing over, occurred between those two uh, genes. So this is a violation of Mendel's principle because we're not getting equal numbers of each. We're getting way more of two because those are the ones that are carried on that chromosome. So they're carried on the same chromosome, and that violates Mendel's principle. So again, we've seen a number of violations of Mendel's principle. I'm going to stop here. We're going to see more, and you're certainly going to see lots more as you continue and progress in your science. But the point is, and I can't emphasize this enough, what Mendel saw was rare. So if there's a trait out there and somebody says, is that trait dominant or recessive? Your best answer, unless you know they're trying to ask you something like that, is it's neither one, because the vast majority of traits are exactly that. They're neither dominant nor recessive.